Guys, good morning. It's good to see you all. And um, definitely, we have been a busy. It's been a busy week, hasn't it? Very busy week. Very stressful for some people. And and I know I do want to take time out that if people have had. And this is all I'll say about the kind of stress that we've had this week. I know a lot of people have been very upset with the way the election turned out and different things like that. There are a lot of people that are. And I always encourage them. I say, look. This is how it goes. This is not the end of the world. It never is the end of the world. And I say, you know, we've said this time and time again. People in 2016 are saying this is the end of the world. 2008, this is the end of the world. 2000, regular, just 2000, they were saying it was the end of the world. Guys, let me tell you, no matter who wins, it's the same guy that's in there. I'm sorry. It's, it's just the way it is. It's politics. Um, but what we have to do is we have to keep focused and Trust in what God's plan is. This is a beautiful country. We have a lot to be thankful for. And if you got questions, you can always go back to the sermon from last week. We talked about, you know, the thing is, there have always been people in position that have used their position in negative ways, positive ways and negative ways that happens. But what we have to be able to do is remember who is on the throne, okay? Who is on the throne? The throne is occupied by a loving, compassionate Savior who is there. And no matter who is in the White House, they cannot promise you what God has promised you. No matter how much promise they might make for a perfect world, I'm sorry, that's impossible with man. It is impossible. However, with God, all things are possible, and that means we trust in him and know that our citizenship is in heaven, and we will submit to his authority above all. Okay, So that's all I'll say about the politics side of it. We done with the election. Praise Jesus. We don't have to see any more ads. Ah, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> we don't have to have any more of them ads. I was getting inundated with ads even on my phone. Here, give this, give that, give this, give that. That happened. So we're done with that. We ain't got to worry about that no more. And today we're going to get our focus right back onto what is important, and that is building God's kingdom. Building God's kingdom. And today we're going to be looking at some scripture in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, starting at verse 26, if you want to turn there. It's time to start looking at some specific examples of conversion in the book of Acts. I've had a lot of people ask for this type of sermon, this type of lesson. And the reason they do is because there are so many people out there that preach a hundred different ways to get to heaven. When the truth is, we know what it takes to get to heaven, and God has called that to our attention through His Word. And we need to be very mindful of what God is saying through the teaching of that Word. And one of the best places to dig and see where those uh, conversions took place is in the book of Acts. I've gotten, I, I'll be honest, since I started as a Christian, this has always been the place where I go, the book of Acts. Because this is plain and simple. The true way, the way God had intended, and the reason these conversions are mentioned in the book of Acts is to help us to understand and be more positive on understanding and being able to communicate what it takes to be a Christian and what it takes from us in our, in our lives to be able to go and change our lives, to, to give ourselves up to Christ. In each case, the gospel message was basically the same. Christ is proclaimed above all things. Christ is is proclaimed. Everything points to Jesus Christ. Response is called for, including faith, repentance, and baptism in each and every situation. Now we have the opportunity to examine the conversion of one of the most popular and important people that you'll see when we get to the book of Acts. Everybody likes to talk about this Ethiopian eunuch, especially me. I love talking about him. Because so many people have different ideas about what happened with this guy. How did he become a Christian? Did he just confess Jesus Christ and it was done? Did he go and do something? What was the motive? Why was this what took place? 
And it all comes down to what Philip preached. And we'll talk about that in some detail. With the account of the conversion of the Ethiopian Union, we not only have the opportunity to confirm what we've already learned, we also can glean a few more points regarding biblical conversions. Let's start reading here and have us a look in Acts chapter 8, verse 26. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get ready, go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert road. And so he got ready and went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship. So this means that he was Jewish. Okay? And he was returning and sitting in his chariot and was reading Isaiah the prophet. Means he had access to the scrolls, and he knew how to read. He was an educated man. He was learned. Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go up and join this chariot. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, Well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he, inv he invited Philip to come and sit with him. Now the passage of Scripture that he was reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb that is silent before the shears. And so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his justice was taken away. Who will describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, of whom does this prophet say from this scripture he, uh, or who this is? Is it himself or is it someone else? Look at verse 35 very carefully. Look at what verse 35 says. I want you to underline it in your book, in your Bible. If you can, if you want to, you can underline it in your Bible. Write it down, whatever you want to do. Highlight this. Then Philip opened his mouth and began from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. Okay? 35 is a very important verse because of what 36 says. As they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched away Philip, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip found himself at Azertus, and as he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. Okay. But I really want to focus in on this sweet little Ethiopian eunuch here. Now, I told you, highlight verse 35. We'll get into that here in a minute. I want to talk about this conversion for a second. Philip is sent to the eunuch, okay? He is sent. An angel of the Lord tells Philip to go to Gaza. Go down to this road that goes to Gaza. And on the way, there is a man sitting in a chariot. He is a eunuch of Ethiopia in charge of the treasury of Queen Candace. He's returning home. He's gone to worship in Jerusalem. That means he's Jewish. He is reading from the prophet Isaiah, okay? He is reading aloud. That is usually how folks read during this time. They're reading aloud. They're going through this. And the way we do, as all good Christians do, and the way this man did, and a good Jewish guy, he wanted to read over it and over and over it. The hard part is trying to be able to grasp what is being said. He is a learned man. He's educated. He knows how to read. He is very smart. And guys, I, I know y'all are looking at me and saying, well, why is it important that we know that this guy is smart and learned? Because in the time of the apostles, in the time of the early church, not a lot of people knew exactly how to read. The Jewish people did. It is why that the scripture is so important. They taught their children to read in the book of Psalms. That's how they taught them to read. They take, chapter, they take Psalm 119 and go through the letters of the alphabet with them. 
They taught and said it is so imperative to learn and to teach our children that we're going to take time out, we're going to educate them, and we're going to give them not just the knowledge and wisdom of history, but we're going to give them the knowledge and history of the church, of the body, of God. We're going to let them know what it is to be a part of this belief system. Because just as history is important, so is God. And today, we have no greater need as parents than to teach our children, to bring our children up in the name of Jesus. That's why I love when I see the youngins up here, man. And I see the kids up here and praying. I'm so proud of them. Because each and every one of them are showing, are being disciplined to know and yeah, it can be a little nerve-wracking. I know, guys. I know. Trust me. I, I, I can't. I, I get nervous when I pray today. I still get nervous praying. And the reason I get nervous praying is because when you come before the throne of grace and mercy, you don't know exactly what to say. But you're trained in that. You're built up in that. Eventually, you get to know it. You eventually get to be able to feel comfortable around God. Because God is there for you. God is your protector. God is your father. God is your creator. Who knows you better than him? Nobody. And so that's what this, that's what this Ethiopian eunuch is doing. Philip's talking to here. Philip's coming to him. He is a man that wants to know more about the God that Isaiah is talking about here. Okay, he's going and he's trying to read here. Philip preaches Jesus to him. He goes and he hears this eunuch reading Isaiah and Philip asks him, you understand what you're reading? You get what he's saying? The eunuch asked Philip for some help. He expressed a need for someone to guide him and he invites Philip to sit along with him. The scripture in consideration here is Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is a very pivotal scripture. When we go and we look about the suffering servant in the Old Testament, when we read those scriptures, when we look at those scriptures, we realize that this man of sorrows, that this man of suffering is Jesus Christ. We recognize that. He's talking about one that is led as a sheep to slaughter, which describes one whose life is taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Isaiah, well, is, is, is David speaking about himself? Is, a song, is, Isaiah, excuse me, is Isaiah talking about himself? Or is he talking about somebody else? And in Acts 8.35 it reads, And Philip opened his mouth and preached Jesus to him. From this scripture, from this point here, we no, Philip is going to preach Jesus. Whoo! And that's a good place to start preaching about Jesus. But if you go by what some preachers say, a lot of people don't know what, what, what is being preached here. But based on the actions of the Ethiopian eunuch, we can tell what the gospel message included. We can conclude that there is talk about repentance, confession, and baptism. You get all that from verse 35? It says he preached Jesus to them. The first thing you do is you point to Jesus. You point to Jesus. You look to Jesus and you say, this is who he's talking about right here in this scripture. And that's how we are with any scripture. We look and we point to Jesus. That's how we should be when we go into the scripture. Everything points to Jesus. God's word and authority, Old Testament and New, points to Jesus. And so, that's what Philip is doing. He goes and he preaches Jesus to him. Now, how do I know that baptism is talked about? Because the eunuch expresses a desire to be baptized. He goes and he sees some water along the way, and he wonders what's stopping him from being baptized. Philip replies in verse 37, in some versions of the Bible, this is not in there, because it's added in later messages, they say. 
But this verse is what's in there in verse 37, 837. Philip says, if you believe in your heart that Jesus is the son of the living God, you know, if you believe that, you will confess it. You'll confess that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. And he says, I do believe this. And it says on there, after saying that, after he confesses his faith in Jesus as the son of God, Philip baptizes the eunuch. He stops the chariot. Both Philip and, eunuch, and the eunuch go down into the water. Philip baptizes him. They both come out of the water. The spirit catches Philip away. And, through, and though seeing Philip no more, the eunuch goes away. And what's he doing? He's rejoicing. He is blessed beyond measure. Philip is found in Azotus and continues preaching in the cities until he arrives at Caesarea. One might properly wonder why the Spirit saw fit to lead Luke to spend so much time describing the conversation of just one person, this whole conversion process of just one individual. Clearly there must be an important lesson in here. Something that we can glean from this historical account. Something happened here. Well, let's have us a look here. There's a couple things we can look at. First off, let's look at the prospects for the gospel here. The Ethiopian eunuch is a religious man, a very religious man. He's traveled all the way from Ethiopia to Jerusalem. Okay? He is reading from the scriptures when Philip found, when Philip finds him there, and he's reading out loud. In fact, most examples of conversion involve very devoted people. You go and you look at the 3,000 at Pentecost. They were assembled at the, in Jerusalem for this express purpose of celebrating Pentecost. The 3,000 there traveled to observe the feast day. Later, we studied the conversions of such people as Paul, who was a Pharisee that was zealous for the law, Cornelius, a devout Gentile who feared God and prayed always. And Lydia, a woman who met every Sabbath to pray with others. So these are very devoted people. These are very devoted people to God. For this we can glean the following. Just because one is religious does not mean they are saved. Okay? Just because somebody is religious doesn't mean they're saved. Now, a lot of people look at me and go, what do you mean? Well, somebody can be religious in science. Did you know that? I've met several people who says, I believe in science. I believe in science. I'm happy. I admit I believe in science. Before I believe in anything that faith believes in, I believe in science. They have faith in science. They have assurance in science. doesn't mean they're saved, does it? They religiously believe that science is the answer. But the problem is this. Who wrote science? Y'all figure that out? A lot of people say, well, mankind doesn't that. No. Nope. Before mankind started figuring what science is, God wrote science. God wrote the science that Create, it works in this entire universe. When we go and we see the planets and the stars and all the things that are in this universe, the great and wonderful, powerful majesty of this entire universe, the very God who wrote the words on the hearts of the prophets also wrote into existence equations. Mathematics, geometry, trigonometry, algebra. He created the laws and the principles that govern this universe. God did. God wrote science. <laughs> so uh, it, it's one of those things. But at the same time, the very creator, the very person, the very being who created everything in this world, including you, created science and math. But does that mean that if I believe in science and math, I'm going to get to heaven? No. I'm believing in the creation, not the creator. And that same way with Judaism was. Judaism was a very, very pointed religion. It pointed to God. 
directly. Well, what does Judaism proclaim? Judaism proclaims that there will be a Messiah who comes. Who's the Messiah? Well, we would say Jesus, wouldn't we? If we do not believe Jesus is the Messiah, though, if we are Jewish people and we don't believe that the Messiah is Jesus Christ, does that mean we're going to get to heaven? No. If we do not believe Jesus Christ is the Messiah, then we're not going to heaven. That is why I tell people, when you talk about religious people, they're not ju- it's not saying someone's saved. Someone can be the most religious person in the world. Someone could believe in witchcraft and believe in all those things that witchcraft preaches and teaches and all the context of it. Does that mean they're going to get to heaven? No. Somebody can be religious in all sorts of different things, but there's only one way to get to heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ. Religious people are often good prospects for the gospel, and you want to know why? Because they already fear God and they respect His authority. If they are believing in the one true God and the principle of God, then they can be shown where the scripture is. If they don't believe in God, you can still show them if they're religious people. If they're people that believe, like in science, you can show them where scientifically God can exist. You can prove it. People look at me and say, well, you can't prove that. It's as easy as being able to prove it doesn't happen. Through God. In fact, it takes more faith to prove that it didn't happen with God than it does to prove that it does happen with God. You have to take all sorts of other equations into care, like <laughs> probability. Oh my gosh. What's the probability we'd be sitting here if we were created four and a half billion years ago from a uh, group of molecules that just decided to get together and form muck. What is the probability we'd be here four and a half billion years from now doing this? The probability is astronomical. In fact, borderline impossible. But if there's an intelligent designer involved, there you go. It can happen. And that is why we ought to be able to show people and be able to teach people who are religious, whether they're religious in God or religious in science or religious in whatever endeavor they're in, the truth. Those who are truly seeking God's will will one day have the opportunity to hear the gospel and obey it. This doesn't discount the fact that ranked sinners often, uh, recept- are often receptive But good people are usually more open to the word. People who will fight you tooth and nail. I was a rank sinner. I admitted it. I admit I'm a terrible guy. But I also will tell you this. I'm blessed to be able to say I have a Savior who loves me and cares for me. And I admit it as such. I have a friend of mine. He was... I don't believe there is a God. I don't think there is a God. And he went through so many trials and problems, and we prayed together and we talked together. Even with him being a non-believer, I prayed with him, and he prayed with me. And he came to church. He came to understand, you know what? Maybe I have been wrong. He came to believe Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. How? Because you can prove to people you can prove to people that God really exists. And then we go back to the Ethiopian's question. Okay? He's already knowing God exists. But I want to go back to 836. I want you to look at what this says here. What hinders me from being baptized? I got a question for you. I want you to look at verse 35 and verse 36. In there, do you see anywhere... Where Philip's preaching came out and it says anything of what Philip preached. Does it say anything in there what Philip preached? He preached Jesus, right? He preached about Jesus starting at that verse in Isaiah. In Isaiah 53. Where does it say you need to be baptized? doesn't does it 
So why did the Ethiopian eunuch just get this epiphany out of nowhere and say, what stopped me from being baptized? I'll tell you where he got it from. He got it from the preaching of Philip. Philip preached repentance, confession, and baptism. It's exactly what he did. Why? Because it's what the Lord said. The purpose of baptism is expressed by Peter and Paul, mentioned within the scriptures. You go and you look at what Acts 2.38 said. Acts 2.38 is in the same book. Happened beforehand. It says, Repent, and each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Simple. And as we have seen and will see, baptism is expressed as when one believes in Jesus Christ. That is what happens. That is what we desire. And I want you to also notice the immediacy of it. He didn't hold off and say, well, I'll wait until I get down to Ethiopia and get baptized. No, 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 no. He said, look over there, there's water. And in fact, if you look in your translations in today, you'll see where it says, look, explanation point. Do you know why? Because he is like, dude, there's water over there. What's stopping me from this point right now? He's excited. He's tore up. He wants to know more about this Jesus guy. He wants to live for this Jesus guy. And he wants to come to know Jesus on his terms. On Jesus' terms. And immediately, he said, there's water. Perhaps because baptism's purpose is such that one does not want to delay. It is for the remission of sins, as 2.38 says. As Acts 22.16, it is the point where we have our sins washed away. As in 1 Peter 3.21, it is an appeal to God for a clean conscience. Indeed, every example of conversion found in the book of Acts, people were baptized immediately just after one lesson. Why? Because there was a need there. There was a need there. From Philip's qualifications, as Acts 8.37 says, we know that we need to believe in Jesus Christ and have faith in him. One must believe in, the, in Jesus as the Son of God. We have to do that. Without faith, God won't do his work in our baptism. You can go and look at Colossians 2.12. I like to preach Colossians 2.12 too. Dylan knows I talk to, I point him too. I'm like, Colossians 2.12, Colossians 2.12. You got friends that say anything about people that baptisms will work, get baptisms will work, you point them to Colossians 2.12. And the reason you point them to Colossians 2.12 is because it is a work. It's just not our work. Baptism is not our work, period. It is God's work. It is God doing the working in us. It is God putting His Holy Spirit within you. It is putting that indwelling Holy Spirit within you and you coming up in the newness of life. That's God's work, not ours. God has allowed that to happen. That is His work being done in us, not ours. And that means that we can have hope and assurance that our work is not going to get us to heaven it's God's work that's going to get us to heaven. It's God's work through Jesus Christ that we're going to heaven. But we've got to believe in Jesus Christ and we need to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Unless you believe all, with all your heart, you are not a proper subject for baptism. It's like somebody comes up and tells me, I want to be baptized. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? No. You don't believe in Jesus Christ, but you want to be baptized? Yeah, I just want to get baptized. Why? Why do you just want to get baptized if you don't even believe in Jesus Christ? Ah, to get me to heaven. No. You see what I'm saying? Baptism alone does not save. There's something you don't hear every day, is it? You hear that in the Christian church, people look at you. <gasps> but what about 1 Peter 3.21? 21? 1 Peter 3.21 says, Baptism now saves you, not the washing of dirt from the body, but an appeal to God for a clean conscience. How do you receive the clean conscience? You receive the clean conscience by believing in Jesus Christ. You have to believe in Jesus Christ. Believing is just as important as being baptized. Confession is just as important as being baptized. Repentance is just as important as being baptized. You see what I'm saying? It's just the same thing. 
God has always required wholehearted, deep, religious, believing love for him. An outpouring of love. Now, a lot of people hate that word religion today. What does James say? James says, pure religion, pure and undefiled is giving, uh, giving to widows and orphans. Taking care of the widows and orphans. Why? Because you're loving God and you're loving others. That's the honest truth. If you love God and you love others, you will want to submit to God. And you'll want to give God with all your heart. Not just part of it. All your heart. That's what God wants. Unless you are willing to believe with all your heart. Baptism ain't going to do it. We see that baptism involves water. In fact, much water. That's why the Ethiopian eunuch says, Look, there's water. What's stopping me from being baptized? They went down into the water. This takes away the whole notion that I can take a cup and just throw it at you or a squirt gun and spray you with water. You know, that's actually been done in some churches. That's crazy as that sounds. Baptism, social distancing style. No joke, seen pictures of it. Craziest thing I've ever seen. But that's honestly what people think. They think that's what baptism is. It's not. He baptized him. It says in Acts 8 that Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch went down into the water. He baptized them and they came up out of the water. Not he, they. Both of them did. Later, we see the same truth expressed by Peter in Acts 10, 47, 48 when he says, how, when he's, talking about, uh, when he's talking about Cornelius and his family being baptized, he says, how can we deny these people the water to be baptized in? How can we deny them the water to be baptized? Water, water, water. It's always involved water. Lots of water. And so it is a burial in water. Both Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch went down into that water. We see that baptism is not a public confession of one's faith. Some say that the purpose of baptism is a public confession of Christ's faith, or people's faith in Christ, especially those who deny that baptism is for the remission of sins. Seeking to provide a reason for baptism, they offer this as an alternative. They go and they say, yeah, that's, that's what it is. It's an outward sign of an inward grace. But baptism, as it is referred to in the Bible, does not say that is the purpose for it. If the purpose of baptism is to publicly confess one's faith, why did Philip baptize the Ethiopian eunuch there? Why did he do it? Why did they do it on a desert road in the middle of nowhere? Why? Why were they? They were all alone in a desert. Why, did Philip, why didn't Philip answer the eunuch's question differently? He wanted to know what would hinder him from being baptized. If baptism is a public confession of one's faith, we would expect Philip to say he must wait until they get to town and, and, and get a group of people around, find a church, and immerse him there. It doesn't say that. The purpose of baptism is such that it can be done in public or in private. It can be done in public or in private. It can be done with thousands present or with just one doing the baptism. Later, we'll see that the conversion of the Philippian jailer also involved baptism in relative privacy. We'll talk about that as well during this course. But I want you to simply think about this Ethiopian eunuch here today. We are impressed with the simplicity of salvation when we look at it through his eyes. With his simple presentation of the gospel, one can be saved after just one lesson. Now, I'm not saying that you're going to get, you're going to talk to one person and they're going to automatically believe it and they're going to automatically be baptized. I know that's not always the case. But it's interesting that the case was made with the, with the Ethiopian eunuch and later with the Philippian jailer and with Lydia and with many others. One lesson. Whether it is preached to large crowds or just one person, the gospel is indeed God's power to save, just as Romans 1.16 says. When the gospel of Jesus is preached, the death of Jesus for our sins will be stressed. The importance of baptism as commanded by Jesus will be mentioned as well, such that people will say, what's stopping me? 
There's water there. What's stopping me? We live in a country where water flows. We've got water right here in our backyard. It's going to be cold, but guess what? There's some patches in there where we can cover some people with some water. Why? Because that's what we've been told to teach. The purpose of baptism will properly be understood knowing that one can be baptized in private just as well as in public. There's no necessity of going and trying to make a noise about it. The necessity for a wholehearted faith in Jesus will be emphasized. Otherwise, one is just simply getting wet. Like I said, what happens to somebody who just says, I don't believe in God, but I want to get baptized so I can get to heaven. And I pull up a wet center is what I do. I dip them and I pull them up, they're wet. Hey, all right. It has to come in combination with everything. All points considered. Was your conversion anything like that? Did they preach Jesus to you? And did they preach the need to confess, to repent, to be baptized? Did they preach that? You see, that is our assurance in our faith and our salvation. If not, have you considered why not? Could it be that the gospel of Jesus Christ in all its glory was not shared with you in its fullness. Some people try to hide that stuff. I don't want to be guilty of that. I know a lot of people don't like hearing about that. It's one of the reasons I'm preaching about it this month. A lot of people be coming and thinking, okay, we're going to hear Thanksgiving sermons. You know, Thanksgiving sermons. I understand. But do you know what you've got to be thankful for? Salvation. What greater gift is there than salvation to be thankful for? The thankful for the Son of God who came and died upon the cross for each and every one of us. That whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. If we believe in that, we're going to ask the questions. What do I need to do to be saved? Peter says you've got to repent. You've got to repent. You've got to be willing to give your sin up. You've got to lay it at the cross of Jesus Christ. You've got to be willing to leave it behind and turn back to God. You've got to confess Jesus Christ. Just as Philip says here to the Ethiopian eunuch, he says you've got to believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of the living God. Do you believe this? And he says, yes, I do. You confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. You're baptized, born of forgiveness of sin, and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You're assured through God's work, as Colossians 2.12 says, that it's not your work being done, it's God's work. And after that, we just keep pressing on with the love of Jesus Christ. Are we going to do things perfectly? No. Are we going to have days when we stumble? Yes. But that is why there is the grace of Jesus Christ there for us to rely on. So that we may be motivated and strengthened through Him not ourselves. This morning, if you've got a decision in your heart, we're going to sing out hymn, 36, or hymn uh, 124. If you've got a decision in your heart this morning, if you want to believe for the very first time, or if you want to rededicate yourself to following Jesus, let's do that today. Let's Interested in apologetics and examining why God's Word is historically accurate and true? Get your free copy of our ebook, Arrogant or Accurate, at www.myllbia.com today.